The Commodore 64, the world's best-selling personal computer, is a system that I never owned. Hi everyone, I'm some guy, and welcome to Overanalyzed Adventures. Sorry for, well, being stuck in a Commodore 64, but it's kind of fitting, because the game I'm about to talk to you about today is Lucius. The d -Mate. Here, let me slide it in here. Oh my goodness, it looks right at home now, doesn't it? Lucius the d -Mate is a pretty intriguing little game. It's one of the very rare commercial d -Mates. Now, for those of you that don't know what a d -Mate is, essentially it's the opposite of a remake. That's pretty much it. Now, your typical d -Mate tends to be a fun little fan-made freeware game, or a bizarre Chinese bootleg for some clone NES system that's apparently really popular over there. But anyway, as mentioned earlier, this is a commercial d -Mate, actually made by the genuine developer for, I guess, reasons of nostalgia. And who can blame him? The Commodore 64 had a hell of a jingle. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? In a world of fun and fantasy And ever-changing views And computer terminology Commodore is Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with Damn, with a jingle that strong, who wouldn't want to buy it? Commodore. As I said before, I don't know anything about the Commodore. It's one of those European computers that I never tinkered with, being a dirty poor American. But nevertheless, I'm not here today to talk about the Commodore. Instead, I'm here to talk about Lucius, a game that came out way after the Commodore was introduced. Like decades later. Now Lucius is a product of Helsinki-based developer Shiver Games. It's pretty much the only game they make. They do Lucius and nothing else. Now Lucius is a pretty interesting little title. It's essentially an adventure game where the puzzles revolve around murdering people, and it also has some pretty crummy stealth sequences. Now to be honest with you guys, this game never got the best of reviews upon release. But over time, it did develop something of a cult status. And I always love that phrase, cult status. I just imagine a bunch of white robed people sitting around worshipping the box art to this game. But anyway, you see the thing is about Lucius, it's pretty much the omen. You know, the 1976 classic movie where the Antichrist is running around killing people in the mansion? Yeah, that's essentially what Lucius is. It's more or less the video game adaptation of that movie. Which is actually a pretty cool idea, and surprisingly, no one else has really done anything quite like this. I mean, Lucius, for all of its flaws, does stick out as something pretty damn unique. But like all things, Lucius is getting on in years. So it should come as no surprise that Shiver decided to re-energize the series by doing something bold and different. Rather than remaking their original classic, they demade it to make it appear as if it could run on the Commodore 64. Hell, for all I know, this demake could have came out on cassettes. I honestly wouldn't be all that surprised. But anywho, let's take a look at this little curiosity. A commercial demake. Hmm. Well, I guess I should boot it up. Ooh, yeah. Feels great to finally get out of those eight odd bits and stretch my pixels again. But anywho, folks, I imagine all those beeps and boops we just heard are period appropriate. And while we're on the subject of beats and boops, the music in this game's pretty fantastic. Easily a highlight of it. And as for the plot, it's pretty straightforward. It's 6-6-1966, six, six, and a kid's been born. And I don't think it's the president of Togo. As you can tell by the happy birthday music, it's somebody's birthday. It's a pixel boy in the middle's birthday. Our protagonist, Lucius, and he's surrounded by all of his fr Actually, he doesn't seem to have any friends. It's just his mom, dad, grandpa, and the servants that live in his mansion. Yeah, it doesn't seem that this kid has much of a social life. But any hoot, all of our characters are pretty much here. We got daddy who's a senator. We got mom, who's just a mom and doesn't really seem to do much else besides exist as a mother, although a pretty absent one. And then we got creepy grandpa who, yeah, you know he did something messed up during the war. And then the rest of the servants are, well, pretty nondescript characters. To be perfectly honest with you guys, if you're expecting nice character development in this game, you're going to be really disappointed. And it's reflected in the writing. Not to say that the game's written poorly, it's just pretty simplistic and straightforward. Like right here, the maid's like, hey, go to bed, kid. And we're like, no, we're gonna talk to this mysterious man in the corner. I wonder who he is. Oh, he's tutorial given Lucifer. <sighs> talk about missed opportunities. Now Satan the Dark Lord, Prince of Peace, or whatever you wanna call him, is a fantastic character. But this game horribly underutilizes him. Just think about it. 
This is the first time we're meeting the Dark Prince himself, and he's like, hey, I'm here to give you a tutorial. This is how you pick up items, and just do what I say, so then we can carry on with the game. We just want to make sure you know how to play an adventure game, you know. <sighs> Ray Weiss, this Satan ain't. They called him Jimbo. Jimbo the Dancing Monkey. The only time I felt a bit blue, I'd come and watch Jimbo dance. Dance that monkey dance. He was even taught to pick pockets. So multi-talented. But this devil is not that cool or interesting. He's just here to show us how to kill a maid for reasons that I just can't explain. She has to be killed though because it's a part of the tutorial. You know, this game really was fitting for a D-make. That scene is just really cool. It feels so grungy and dirty, and a lot more horrific than anything in the original game. I don't know, maybe it's the music and the low-res graphics, but it seems genuinely more disturbing in 8-bits than in 3D. But then again, I'm a pixel man, so I have a bias. <laughs> I do apologize, but I want to let the jams play out a little bit. But anywho, this little text dump on the screen right here is written by the detective sent to investigate the death that occurred at this house. And it's going to be popping up throughout the game. Pretty much how this game works structurally is you get a murder, then you get a text blurb from the detective sent to investigate the death. And those text blurbs are pretty much the only source of narration throughout this game. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not about to read these text dumps to you guys, so I'll just summarize. Ooh, I'm an angsty detective. I'm hard-boiled and I've been sent to this mysterious house that harbors secrets. <laughs> Hinting that maybe the kid might be involved in some messed up stuff. <laughs> Again, Lucius's story is not exactly its strong suit. To be perfectly honest with you guys, if you're gonna make heads or tails of this game's plot, at least early on, you're gonna have to read the back of the box. Or the About This Game blurb on Steam. Because that little blurb right there has a lot of plot information that the game just doesn't reveal for some reason. Like in particular, that Lucius was a normal little boy until his birthday, which I imagine was the scene we watched at the very first of the game with the birthday party. But apparently though, somehow during that scene, it must have been off camera, his true calling was revealed to him. That's right, somehow with that little birthday party we witnessed, he realized he was Lucifer's son and the Antichrist, and he decided to blindly follow Satan and murder for him. I mean, that story sounds awesome, but for some reason, Lucius has it completely cut out. Apparently, in microseconds, he's like, yo, Antichrist, go to murder people. Oh, Satan's in my room. Tell me what special abilities I have to kill people in your name with. Yeah, that's the game, folks. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and it seems like a hell of a missed opportunity. But oh well, I will give underwhelming Lucifer some credit. At least he seems like a caring father. He's like, boy, I appreciate you murdering that lady for me. Tell you what, I'll make sure you don't get in trouble. You should go back down and take the lock off the freezer, because that way no one will suspect a murder. Instead, they'll think a horrific accident happened. Boom. I'm Satan. I'm watching out for you, Sonny. I'll be watching you. Unfortunately, there's no one as sexy as Sting in this game, but what we do get is the detective showing up for the first time to the mansion. He's like, yo, I'm a detective. I'm sorry for your tragedy. It clearly looks like a horrific accident happened here. And Charles, our not daddy daddy, is like, oh, what a dreadful thing. Our family is really affected by this seemingly random accident that mysteriously happened. Nothing sinister at all could be happening here. And then we get a scene where our not daddy daddy is talking to his campaign manager who's all like, I'll keep this out of the press. I've worked with you for years. I've helped you become a powerful man and a U.S. senator. And our daddy's like, thanks, man. I don't know what I would do without you. And then we just cut back to Lucius in his room. And apparently we have to kill the campaign manager now. It doesn't really tell us. We just kind of have to wander around the house or look at the map. And then eventually the game gets all like, oh, kill cam. 
Now this really baffles me. Why does Satan want to kill the campaign manager? Is he just dead set on destroying the senator's life for reasons that really don't seem beneficial at all to the Antichrist? I don't know, perhaps Satan is just really out of touch. I mean, after all, the last time we heard a lot about him, the Roman Empire was around, so maybe he just assumes that senators are a largely ceremonial role in society and doesn't realize that they really hold the keys of power in American politics. <sighs> Satan, you need to take a civics class, man. But oh well. We're going to burn a man's face off, so I guess we got that going for us. Look, it's the detective again. He's shown up, and yeah, he's gonna be like, oh, it looks like a terrible accident happened here. What a horrible thing. And Charles is gonna be like, oh my god, my campaign manager, I'm screwed now. Why are terrible things suddenly happening to me for no reason? Oh, well, Charles, your life is just gonna be on a downward spiral from here on out for reasons that I don't understand. But hey, Satan's back, and he's here to give us another tutorial. But hey, at least we get to have a nice magic power now. Telekinesis. We can move stuff around without touching it. Now you may be thinking, oh, we're going to use that to just have all sorts of fun. And if your idea of fun is just using this ability as a permanent inventory item, then you're 100% correct on your definition of fun, because that's pretty much all you can do with this thing. It's an inventory item. You only use it on select things in the universe, only when the game wants you to. You just can't go around flinging things with your telekinesis because that would just be too much fun folks oh hey the detective's back and he's all like hmm there's really something gruesome going on there i don't know what's up i can't put two and two together i suppose it's supposed to be suspenseful but to be honest with you guys we already know the kids the antichrist we're playing as him we talk to the devil regularly we know who the villain is in this game, so the detective kind of slowly figuring it out doesn't really pull me in much. But oh well, at least he tells us who we have to kill this go-around, so that's kind of nice. And it's a drunken repairman. I guess maybe we're turning it into something like the Seven Killer now? You know, killing people who are committing sins, but you'd think the devil would actually like people committing sin. That's kind of like his whole game, so murdering people for being sinful seems a bit... Well, I'm not quite sure how else to put it, but it seems a touch conservative for Lucifer. But hey, we get a nice little pixel art kill again. <laughs> wow, that must have been a heavy piano to crush his head like a grape. But, as you can imagine, the formula has been established now. Detective shows up. Terrible accident, Charles is like, ah, oh, another friend of mine's dead. My whole world's coming undone. And maybe Mary gets in there and she's like, oh, I'm starting to get distraught with all these killings going on. I'll just stay more distant and not really talk to my child much at all and pretty much be a non-existent character throughout this entire game. Now you may be wondering at this point, hey, is this game missing any content? No, the actual Lucius is just like this. This game's pretty much a one-to-one -one remake. Even the words are seemingly the same. I, mean, I didn't really check it out in detail, but pretty much this is the game. It's just in 8 bits instead of in 3D. So I don't think anything's been cut out. It's just that paper thin of a plot. Speaking of paper thin, you know the human skull is about as thin as, I don't know, well there's a blade going through this guy's face. I couldn't think of a good pun. Yeah, that guy was a butcher and Lucius just killed him. It feels like a filler kill to me. Doesn't seem to be any reason to kill him other than we could, so we did, and Satan's cool with it, and the butcher's dead. I mean, Yay, you're the Antichrist, but you're just killing poor working stiffs just, well, cuz. Well, I suppose no one should be too terribly surprised that Lucifer doesn't have the best of strategies. After all, he did lose that war. So the same theater happened that's been happening. The detective shows up and he's like, Oh, I'm doing all I can to keep the feds out of your business, Senator Man. And the senator's like, Ah, oh, my world's falling apart. I'm going to lose re-election. Why are terrible things happening to me? And the detective's all like, I don't know. I'm going to put patrolmen around the house and make sure no more accidents happen. And, well, that's what he does. Clearly the stakes are being raised now. And speaking of the stakes being raised, at this point in the game you can go around doing chores, like sorting laundry. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you are rewarded certain items, like a Ouija board that gives you hints, or if you do enough good things, you get a big wheel. Now 
Now that just completes a creepy child killer ensemble. All he needs is like some terrifying suspenders and I think he's got the look down. But anywho, the reason why we're running around at night is to experience some of the game's stealth. Avoid line of sight with characters, solve puzzles to get him to move. Pretty basic stuff. And oh yeah, we're doing this because we're going to get some poison because we're going to poison some food and kill a fat lady. Well, that was pretty gross. And yeah, Satan shows up again, proud as a peach about his kid killing people. So proud he gives him another power. This one of mind control. It's very weak and you can only use it a couple of times in the game under the right circumstances, so... It is such a letdown that the only things we can talk to Lucifer about are tutorial stuff. Nothing else. We never get to know this character. We know nothing about our daddy. One of the great tragic figures in Western civilization. I mean, what motivates this dude? Why does he do what he does? Why is he taking such a keen interest in this kid? Sure, he's the Antichrist, but where are his plans? Never talks about him. He's just like, yo, give you power. This is how you use it. Kill more people, kiddo. Maybe this is Satan's first time at being a father and he's trying to go for the whole cool, distant dad thing. Just show up on holidays, give him presents, and then just ride off on his motorcycle. I'm not talking about my life there or anything. But speaking of holidays, the game jumps forward a little bit and oh my goodness, it's Christmas. The one time of year that you think Satan would hate the most. Or maybe he digs all the commercialization of it. I don't know. But what I do know is that Charles has given a little speech saying, hey, chin up guys. This year sucked, but next year's gonna be awesome. It's the holidays. Surely no tragedy at all is gonna happen around this time of the year. It's not like an icicle is gonna fall into my butler's eye or anything. Oh, well, there goes Alfred. So after the death of the butler, we get a cool little cutscene featuring a nice full view of Charles, who's answering the phone, and oh my goodness, it's a journalist on the other end. And he wants to talk to Charles about all the mysterious deaths going on, and Charles, understandably, is like, oh hell no, and hangs up on the dude. Then he talks to the cop, and he's like, ah, all these deaths, they need to be kept out of the press. I'm a senator running for a re-election. And the cop's like, yeah, we're trying our best to suppress the First Amendment. And then, well, the journalist tries to sneak into the house and the cops find him and we get another cool little pixel art picture. I mean, he's really got that dude by the collar there. So this guy may actually be a legitimate threat to us. Snooping around journalists who could expose, well, what? The Antichrist lives here? Unless he works for the National Enquirer, I don't know if anyone's really gonna buy that. But what I can buy, folks, is that this is the end of the video. Yeah, I don't wanna make these videos too long, so I'm just gonna go ahead and call it quits here. And, well, hopefully I'll see you in part two. Have a good day, guys.